If you want to get to Tripoli, you have to drive there. For five years, commercial flights to Libya have been banned by UN sanctions. Or if you're lucky, the Libyans will drive you themselves. To our surprise, a roomy bus had been sent to the Tunisian town of Djerba to ferry us across the border to Tripoli. And in the bus was a jovial person from the Popular Committee for Foreign Information. But the Libyan idea of openness and ours were rather different. On the Tunisian side of the border, nobody minded us filming our bus as it trundled along beside an unremarkable seashore. On the Libyan side, the landscape wouldn't change, but the orders would. Well, we're now actually in the great Arab Jamahiriya of Libya, and uh, the people apparently have given orders that we're not to be able to film anything between the frontier and Tripoli. We can't show you what's outside the curtains behind me. We can't show you the police car that's in front of us. In fact, we can't film at all apart from this. Led at breakneck speed by our police escort, we sped through the desert towards Tripoli to be in time to film this. As we meet here, therefore, we must reiterate our unflinching support for and solidarity with our brothers and sisters of the great socialist Libyan Arab Jamahiriya. The 57 nations of the Organization for African Unity have been calling for the removal of UN sanctions against Libya for over two years. Now, for the first time, more than 40 busy foreign ministers had agreed to make the awkward overland journey to meet in Tripoli itself. The Libyans were determined to make the most of their diplomatic coup. That evening, delegates and press alike were invited to a banquet by Muammar Gaddafi. First, we were shown round the ruins of the house where his infant adopted daughter was killed by American bombs in 1986. This is more human, I think. Giant murals of the air raid enhance the effect of shattered walls and ceilings. Quite a museum, isn't it? It's kept as it is. Let's for the generation know what, what America has done. Joma Belhir, the urbane general director of foreign information, was on hand to rub the message in. No one can imagine such uh, stupid way of uh, punishing any, any population in the world. This is the style of American administration of Ralph Reagan. Muammar Gaddafi is still one of America's chief bogeymen. The air raid on Tripoli certainly tempered his enthusiasm for financing terror around the world. There's no hard evidence that he even knew about the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie in 1989. But the colonel, or the brother leader, as he's known in Libya, still likes to cut a controversial figure on the world stage. As the patient OAU delegates learned in the course of a two-hour harangue by their host, the man America loves to hate is also a man who loves to hate America. But we're not to America because America is the one who is the one who is the one وهي التي تريد أن تدوس علينا بإقدامها But it had been a long day for everyone لكن هذه فرصة تاريخية وهذا يوم مشهود إذا تعبت أنا من الكلام أو تعبت منتم من السماع هذا شيء في محله At last it was over, and the long-suffering delegates could think about bed. But next morning, outside their seafront hotel, 
they were greeted by a spontaneous demonstration of support by the people. Or at least by some people. They all seemed to be young men of military age, sporting natty tracksuits and neatly printed banners in Arabic and English. What are you demonstrating about? Who decided that it's a good time now to demonstrate? Who told you to come here? Aha, a popular committee. This then was the great Jamahiriya, the state of the masses, in action. Over the next few days, as we waited for our hosts to decide what we could or couldn't film, I had plenty of time in hotel lobbies to read about popular committees. According to Muammar Gaddafi's Green Book, representative democracy is a fraud. The only true democracy is one in which people govern themselves through conferences and committees everywhere. The next day, my new minder from the ministry, Mr. Mohammed Bedri, took me to a seminar on popular democracy at Tripoli's Al Fateh University. We can therefore state that representation is an illusion built on hypocrisy and deception. All sorts of strange people from all over the world were holding forth to a captive audience of Libyan students. Why should people be governed? People know I don't know about my fellow listeners, but I have to say I didn't find it all that illuminating. So I asked the Congress moderator, Dr. Ali Farfar, to explain why Libya, under the guidance of Muammar Gaddafi, found representative democracy so unacceptable. Representation means that people are not there, that decisions are taken on their behalf. And um, this is theoretically, morally, and politically false. This is illegitimate as we see it, because nobody can dream, nobody can think, nobody can decide what the others want to do with their future, with their presence. So it's, uh, this is the idea that the people should be let to decide their own future, to, to decide their own presence. And that, says Dr. Farfur, is exactly what happens in Libya. Every citizen is a member of a basic people's conference. They have the right and the duty to debate and decide on every issue from education to economics. And in Libya, people means women as well as men. We didn't ask to visit a television factory. We weren't entirely sure why we were taken there. But like any other electronics assembly plant around the world, women's nimble fingers were doing the work. And the workers we spoke to, chosen by us, not the management, seemed genuinely proud of what women had achieved in the great socialist Jamahiriya. And is that divorce law agreed by all the men in Libya as well? <laughs> Decisions like that, which affect the whole nation, are taken by the General People's Congress. Delegates from hundreds of basic conferences travel twice a year from all over Libya to the new capital city of Siat, and we were going too. In a smart official Mercedes, we hurtled 500 kilometers east in less than three hours. 
And then, for more than 24 hours, we waited in a hotel lobby as Congress delegates came and went. We weren't allowed to film the city. We very nearly weren't allowed to film the Congress. The state of the masses, it seems, is as paranoid as any dictatorship about what foreign journalists can and cannot do. But when we finally did make it into a Congress session, it was a good deal livelier than we'd expected. At this particular session, they were debating nothing more exciting than a new system of awards for good citizenship. Even so, there was plenty of argument. Each delegate is the secretary of a basic conference or committee. The numbered boards tell the chairman who they speak for. They're here to give voice to decisions that have already been taken by their members. Even the feistiest delegate insisted when we asked him that he was no more than the servant of his basic conference. بالنسبة للجماهيرية يعلم العالم كله أنها أصبحت جماهيرية الحكم للشعب كفو أنه ينفذ في جميع القرارات اللي تديرهم الجماهير في مؤتمراتها هي اللي تبقى عليه الشخص المناسب في المكان المناسب من المواطنين وغيرهم المزايا التالية And the same goes, he insisted, for the people we would call government ministers. There they all were, lined up at the Congress, and the Congress could hire them or fire them. But one person was notable for his absence. <laughs> Muammar Gaddafi was still in Tripoli, meeting and greeting his African visitors. Though he behaves like a head of state, he can't be dismissed by the Congress, with the simple reason that officially, the guide of the revolution holds no position in the government hierarchy from which he can be dismissed. We look at him as an educator, as a teacher. Sometimes his uh, interventions become the guiding principles for the people, but it is not um, his ideas or his decisions that uh, make the people um, decide. They're always free to say no any time they don't want to approve his ideas. But it's very seldom indeed that the basic conferences disregard the guidance of the omnipresent brother leader. The secretary Abdel Khadir was frank enough to admit. In your experience, have there been any times when a recommendation of the leader of the revolution has actually been rejected by the members of your base congress? When it comes to making sure the foreign press adhere to their suggestions, the Libyans are past masters. This was the big day, the 20th anniversary of the foundation of the great Jamahiriya, and we were off to see the celebrations, or so we thought. One of the problems about filming in Libya, we've discovered, is that the Libyans' idea of what might interest you and our idea of what might interest you are two totally different things. We tend to find ourselves put on buses without consultation, without warning, and taken to the most amazingly boring places. We were in the right town, Miserata, where we'd been assured there'd be a day of festivities. But the Libyans believed we'd find a tour of a steel mill a lot more fascinating. Um, we are going to start from uh, the point where raw materials are received and delivered to the... Uh, to start the process of production. And worse was to come. Well, this experience is 
going from the mysterious to the bizarre. We thought we were coming to Misrata to see the 20th anniversary festivals of the great Jamahiraya. So far we've seen a steel mill and now we're in a stationary boat in the harbour. Uh, I think the idea is that we're going to rest and repose and collect ourselves because this evening there'll be another speech from the great leader and hopefully sometime we will get to see these festivities. But it's um, five o'clock in the afternoon and so far we've seen absolutely nothing. By the time we got to the town centre, the daylight was dying, and so were the celebrations. But the main event, as the Libyans saw it, was still to come. In the back corridor of a cavernous stadium, we were warned to be ready for the great man's entrance. Chaos and anarchy in that dark passageway were typical, it seemed to me, of the system Gaddafi has put in place. Nobody in Libya seems to know who's in charge of what. Nobody but Gaddafi really knows where they're going. Everybody's watching their backs. In the state of the masses, there are no political parties and no national organizations around which opposition can form. The voice of militant Islam has been drowned out by revolutionary enthusiasm. Only the army, on which Gaddafi once lavished billions, has the cohesion to threaten him. Now it's being disbanded in favour of popular militias and a bevy of rival security forces. Everywhere is amateurish confusion deliberately fostered. And above it all, serene and unperturbed, floats the man who's officially in charge of nothing. <laughs> هذا القانون يغير شيء ومن حقك انت المواطن اللي في الشعب وما عجبك هالقانون او ما عجبتك هالماده تعيد اثارته تعو... تعيد اثارته مره ثانيه تعود اثارته مره ثانيه في المؤتمر الشعبي بتاعك His vanity is awesome, his pretensions limitless. But whatever he and his admirers may believe, his country is a grim, unlovely place. Like most visitors, we left Gaddafi's Libya without regret.